You just heard about Streamly, like this quickly build your data science web app. What kind of widgets can you use? Well, you know what? I'm going to go through all of the Streamly widgets for you in this one video. Buckle up, create an empty app.py, import Streamly as st, and then run the Streamly run app.py command. It's going to be a long ride. Write a magic. Stream it as an st.write method that interprets the variable that you put as argument and then print it inside the web app. So you can give it text or a matplotlib chart, an Altair chart, or a pandas data frame, and it's going to print in the web app accordingly to its type. You can call multiple variables in there, and they're going to be stacked vertically from top to bottom. Even more lazy, just write the name of the variable in your script and Streamlit is going to try and wrap it around an st.write command to print it for you. I use this in live demos or interactive lectures every time. I, I tell my students they have to imagine that st.write is like a print to the web app and I can just put anything I want in this. Streamlit is going to manage it for you. Text element. So now that we are familiarized with st.write, it's time to go into the more specific widget to display text and information. Title, header, subheader. Use this to structure your content. You can add an encore argument to quickly navigate through your app by changing the URL. Markdown. If you know how to build GitHub readmes, you know your way around Markdown and you can display it in Streamlit. It also accepts emoji shortcodes so you can add some emotions to your apps. And also LaTeX formatting if you want to put mathematical formulas inside your markdown. It also accepts a uh, unsafe allow with HTML argument, which you can use to color your text in blue or use the CSS hack. Caption. You can add small text in Streamlit as footnotes, for example. Code. Add code snippets to your code to explain to your colleagues how you implemented backpropagation in your deep learning model. Text. Write text. Yeah. I, I don't know what to say about it. LaTeX. It's for math. Now it's time to showcase some data. Table and data frame. I use st.table when I need to display a small configuration table in my app. But whenever I've got a bigger data frame to display, like the penguins <laughs> data set, I will use the st.data frame method because it comes with height and with scroll bar so you can scroll inside your data frame. Shroomit also accepts a panda styler which you can use to add some color formatting to your cells. For example, you can color any game to penguin as blue. Metric. You know those BI dashboards that show a big number and the up arrow and down arrow and they are ST metric here for you. JSON. Streaming is a pretty good JSON viewer. I can just scrap data from the YouTube or Twitter API, dump it inside stjson, and then scroll inside the documents while I edit the code to extract the information that I need. Altair. Altair is a Python wrapper around the Vegalite specification. So you use it to build interactive JavaScript oriented visualization with Python. Have a look at the example gallery. You can specify the use container with argument to tell Streamlit that every time it gets a chart, it should extend it to the width of the container. So you can then select to display the container as wide or constrained and the chart is going to respond accordingly. Line chart, area chart, bar chart are easy to use Whopper methods around Altair. So you can use them to quickly display data, but whenever you want to edit the legends or the title, then you are going to go back to the Altair chart because you cannot customize those three methods. Vegalai. If you don't like playing with the Altair API and prefer JSON, you can use the Vegalite chart method to render Vegalite JSON specifications. Plotly and bokeh. Let's stay in the interactive plotting libraries. We are more used to using them because Streamlit only has to send JSON from the server to the client and the client is going to render the JSON as a chart. It's going to be much faster than libraries like matplotlib. And in this environment, we've got the plotly chart method and the bokeh chart method. Now, I personally use a lot of plotly express charts when I need to integrate shots with, in, on which I can zoom and quickly interact with. 
But some of our harder plots in the Streamlit community use a lot of bokeh because you can build more JavaScript oriented interactions between the data points, but know that you can use both. Don't try to integrate bokeh applications or plotly dash. It's not going to work. Matt plotly. Eh? What? Oh, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, sure. As a data scientist, obviously, we have a, a pyplot method that you can use for matplotlib charts or any libraries that depend on matplotlib like Seaborn, GeoPandas, or Plot9, etc. I just did a video about it. Go check it out. Graphviz. If you want to display cyclically decision trees, you can export the tree as a dot file and then render it with the graphviz method. Pyduck. Now go get yourself a Mapbox token and store it inside your configuration file. We are going to draw some maps. With the PyDeck library, you can build 3D maps, point cloud, or scatter plots over a map. There's a good Streamlit demo called the New York City Uber Ride Pickups, which will showcase the power of PyDeck to you. If it looks a little bit overwhelming, you can use the map method, which is a simplified version that takes as input a data frame of geolocations to display a map with a scatter plot with each point corresponding to a latitude and longitude. Add row. A little feature is that data frame and chart elements accept an add rows method to programmatically add numpy or pandas data. This is a quick way of running a real time life plot simulation. You can't edit nor remove data from elements. For that, you'll have to wait a little bit longer to learn about overriding elements with data from a state object. Media elements. As deep learning masters, you are going to generate a lot of images and audio and videos, and you can display those three types inside Streamlit. Or we can take raw data from a file, numpy data you generated from an algorithm, file names, or an URL. Yeah, we've gone through a lot. You know how to display information inside Streamlit, but now we need to react to the app so anyone can interact with it and say, look, I have built something. Input elements. Most of the following elements share some functionality. So here's the info that is common to all of the elements. The first function parameter is the label of your widget. You've got the help argument if you want to add a little tooltip to your widget. You can disable any widget with the disabled argument so people don't misclick when obviously it's already right. The key argument is really important because it is the identity of your widget. By default, it's going to be the label of the widget, which is why if you've got multiple widgets that are named click me then streamlit is not able to differentiate between those two and will return an error so make sure to add unique identifiers to your widget using the key argument button click the button and it will return true don't click on it and it will return false we use this in an if condition to access some code after clicking on the button like run this model checkbox if it's checked it will return true otherwise it will return false a long time ago this was our preferred way of showing or hiding multiple sections radio returns the selected radio button for a given list of items. I use this for example to select the kind of algorithm I want to use before running the whole code. SELECT BOX it's like radio, but the items are put in the select box. One of our favorite way of using the select box is by building multiple methods that will show different streamly content and then map each item of the select box to a particular method. So when you select an item in the select box, you display a whole new page of Streamlit content. This is like the poor man's multi-page app. Multi-select. Basically, select box, but on steroids, because you can select multiple values. I like to pass my data frame columns in there and then run some descriptive statistics on every column that I select inside the multi-select. Slider to define the numeric value or date that you want to use. It accepts numbers and date. If you pass a tuple as a default value, this transforms into a range slider so you can select the minimum value and the maximum value. 
Select slider. What do you think happens when a select box and a slider have a baby? It's like a slider, but non-continuous. Text input. Have the user write its name in the text input and then print it back. By specifying the type argument to password, the text input will be masked by star so your user can write its password. Text area. It's like text input but what? Both accept a max number of characters with the max card argument. If you want to build a UI to send tweets, you can limit the size of the tweet here. Number input. This is dedicated to choosing a number. You can also scroll through a range of numbers defined by the mean, max, and step value. Date input. This is nice. You get a calendar to select a date. It looks like any selected date to book a plane or a hotel room. It returns a date time. And like for the slider, if you put as default value a tuple, you will get a range date input. So you can select a time period with a minimum and a maximum value. Time inputs. It's a select box with lots of different times, so you don't have to create it yourself. File uploader. Upload your Excel file there, read as a pandas data frame, and do some extreme data computation there. You can limit the type of file that you can upload through the type argument, which takes as input a list of file formats. If you want to upload multiple files, enable the accept multiple files argument. Then you're going to get a list of file uploads as a result. The return result is of type uploaded file. You can use get value on them to get the content as a byte array, or it's also a file-like object, so you can use it with read CSV or read text or anything that accepts a file as argument. Download button. Imagine you've uploaded your Excel file, you did some pretty cool computation with it and you want your user to download it back. Then you can add a download button to download as a CSV. Camera input. Say chi to the webcam. It will take a picture and upload it to Streamlit. Color picker. Select a color and get its X representation back and then use it to colorize your face from the camera input. If you did not find your favorite widget you can go and have a look at the streamlit components tracker it has community built widgets like real-time video or drawable canvas that you can use inside your app yes you can build your own components with html css and javascript but that's for another video tell me in the comments if you're interested How do I tell Streamlit which part of the application should react? We know how to stack our widgets vertically. Can we do better? <laughs> this is the cherry on the cake. You're a Streamlit expert.